Hey math fans, Alex here, and in the last video, we described theoretical and experimental probability, and then I connected the two. Uh, one quick note that I forgot to mention about experimental probability, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but experimental probability is also called it's also called relative frequency. It's a kind of an outdated term in my opinion. I never use this and I probably won't use it very much at all. But since the title of this section was theoretical probability and relative frequency, I thought I'd bring it up. Now in this video, we're actually going to talk about simulations and how people determine experimental probabilities without going through the effort of performing the experiments thousands, if not millions of times. So I'll meet you back over to trinket.io, which is an IDLE for Python. See you there. All right, and here we are at trinket.io, where the IO stands for input output. So what we're gonna be doing in this part of the video is making a program to simulate flipping a coin however many times that you want. So let's get started. I'm just gonna zoom in here so you can see what I'm doing. The first thing that you have to do is you have to import a library um, called random. And that's going to allow us to generate random numbers, which is a very, very advanced topic that even I don't fully understand. But in order to simulate flipping a coin, you need to pick between two random numbers. One of them is going to represent heads. One of them is going to represent tails. So the first thing we do is assign that a variable. Let's just go with num for number. And that is going to equal ran, random dot rand range one to three. The reason I say one to three is because it doesn't include three for whatever reason. Okay, so just to give you a quick like output here, we're just gonna print num and see if that works. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out and we're gonna see what happens. Okay, so our output was one, which is a random number between one and three, not including three. If I run it again, I get a one, again a one, one, two, one, two, okay, you can see if I keep cl clicking, it does kind of alternate between one and two in a random fashion. Now, what we wanna do is we want to count the number of heads in our trial. Okay, so we're gonna start off by just doing one trial of flipping a single coin. So what we're gonna do is we have to define heads, and we have to do what's called initializing it. That means you have to start by setting it equal to some sort of value, in this case, zero. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say heads is equal to zero. We don't have any heads yet. Num is just gonna be some random number that's either one or two. We're gonna say if, if the value of num is equivalent to one, okay? This double equal sign always confused me when I was little. Um, but this means if the literal value of num is one, if it is stored as a one, then do stuff. This equal sign is an assignment of a variable. You're saying the variable takes on this, okay? But this is a condition that it's checking. If the random number is one, then we want the heads to go up by one. So the way you do that is you say heads is going to be replaced or transformed with heads plus one. Okay, so again, I like to think of these equal signs as like arrows. That's not the correct syntax in any programming language I know, but the idea is that heads is being transformed into heads plus one. So it was once zero, it was initialized at zero, and now it's one, because we have a heads, if the random variable takes on the value one. Okay, so after that, We don't need an else because if num is not equal to one, then we don't do anything to heads. So there's no point in doing that. Um, I guess if you wanted to, you could initialize a different variable called tails, but since there are only two, I don't think it's really gonna be that confusing. So we wanna then print num and we want to print heads. So your prediction should be that these two should match, right? Because if we get a value of one for num, that means our heads is gonna be one. If we get a value two for num, heads should be zero. Okay, so let's see if that works. 
There we go. So two does match up with zero. And if we get a one, that matches up with one head. So this is the number of heads. And of course you could be a little bit more specific and say, you know, the number heads is And then let's see, zoom out again. There you go. And since we got a two, the number of heads is zero. Now that's very uninteresting, right? That is a single trial of something that I could just do with that coin sitting over across on the edge of my table. Well, let's, let's up the ante. Let's do 10 trials now. Okay, well, how are we gonna do that? Well, we have to do what's called put the code inside a loop. So there are two different kinds of loops. There's a for loop and a while loop. I'm going to show the for loop because I kind of like it better. So the idea is we are going to have to put all of this other than the heads. We have to put all this in a for loop. So here's how we do it. For i in range 10, colon. That colon means everything else has to be indented. Okay, so technically I should have done this first, but I'm just kind of trying to show you how methodical this is. Okay, here we go. And then after that, we're gonna print num. And then this is the very end of our program. Okay, so all of this is gonna be happening 10 times because our range is 10. i is just a dummy variable, and here's what the code says. For i in range 10, we're going to establish the random number every single time we do this. We're going to keep establishing a random number for all 10 times. If that num is equal to 1, increase the value of heads by 1. And then we're going to print num and we have to do one more thing. We have to let i be equal to i plus 1. We have to, and remember I think of this as an arrow, right? i is kind of going to the next one. Okay, so with that, what should we have in our output? We should have 10 nums. And at the end of all 10 of those random numbers that are either gonna be ones or twos, we should have a final print statement that gives us the total number of heads. Okay, so let's see if that works. Okay, so you can't quite see it. So we get, let me zoom in over here, we get, exactly what I said. We get a bunch of random either ones or twos, and then at the end it counts it up and says the number of heads is five. Yay, I got the right answer, right? Because theoretically I should get exactly one half heads and one half tails. That doesn't usually happen, right? In fact, if I run this again, now I got seven heads. If I keep running it, I will get a different number of heads every single time. And you might ask, well, how off is that? Let's see. So what I can do now, this is more data analysis instead of programming, but we're gonna assign a new vari uh, variable. Let's let it be uh, per num for percentage. Well, per heads, I guess. Percentage of heads. And that is gonna be equal to, we're gonna take the number of heads and we have to divide that by 10. That's the number of trials. That's gonna give us a percentage. And then what we're gonna do is, let's see how off that is from 50%, okay? So uh, let's see, I have to think about this for a second. So this is gonna give, me, give us the percentage of heads. So the first thing that I wanna do is I want to take, let's define error as we take that percentage, subtract it from 0.5, Okay, that gets us the difference between the experimental value and the theoretical exact value. And then we take it times 100, well, we take it times 100 to get a percentage. So that's the, that's the percentage error. Okay, so then after all of this, we're gonna print the percent error. I need to put it in, this percent error is comma, per error, comma, percent. Okay, so let's see if this works now. We're gonna run it. 
what do we get? We get a bunch of stuff. We get that the number of heads is seven, which is 70%. How off is the 70%? Well, that's 20% higher than 50%. So it looks like it gives us the correct value. But I'm still not satisfied because 10 trials isn't a whole lot. I mean, how long would flipping 10 coins take you? Like 30 seconds? Not very long. So this still doesn't give you a very accurate estimate. And according to the stuff from the last video, as the number of trials n approaches infinity, that's when the theoretical probability and the experimental probability start to match. Well, that's super easy to fix. What's the one number in this entire program that I can change that would give me more trials? Pause and think about it. The answer, this number the range. Let's up the ante to 100. And then of course we have to divide this by 100 uh, just to keep consistent. And then when I run the program, I get a whole lot of stuff. Okay, I don't like that. I don't like it. So instead, I'm actually going to comment out printing the num after every single trial. So now when I run it again, it already does all the, the hard work. And now all it's going to give me is the number of heads and the percentage error. Well, last time I think we got a percentage error of like, what, 20%? And this is minus 4%, which means it's 4% lower than what it should be. That's fine. If I run it again, I get 7%. It's a little bigger. That's fine. Minus 1%. That's great. It's almost accurate. And you can keep running through this and get different values. But I want to up the ante even more. I'm going to go crazy. Let's do a million trials. I think I said in my last video, you can do a million trials. Let's just do 1 million trials. Of course I have to zero, 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 zero. Let's do it. You ready? I'm going to run it. Ooh, it's pausing. It's pausing. That is because the computer is not doing magic. It's not spitting out a bunch of garbage. It is literally doing those million trials in real time. There is computing power going towards all those trials and it is giving us a number that is, oh my Lord, so close to 500,000. It is off by not even 0.1%, not even off by a percent, not off by 0.1%, 0.01%. Now, could it be off by 10%? Yes. But the majority of these trials, you group them together, bam, less than 0.1% error. Here's another one, bam, less than point, you know, 0.02% error. Okay, so this is really how people do experimental probabilities. They don't actually do the experiment, they write code to represent that. Okay, so as an exercise, And this is only for people that are a little bit familiar with code and want to give this a try, specifically Python. So exercise, write a program to simulate Okay, I don't know why it's why it's doing that. To simulate paradox given by Demer in the previous episode. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm just gonna give you a, a little hint. Remember, he rolled three dice, and then he calculated the sum, and he discovered that experimentally, you're more likely to get a sum of 11 than 12. Well, you can experimentally verify that by writing a computer program. What you're gonna probably want to do is define three nums, num1, num2, num3, that represent random integers between 1 and 6. So this number should probably be 7. And then you add all those up in a new variable called sum. And then you just keep repeating the trials and, and you put that in a for loop. So really everything's there. Again, the most important part is that you want to make sure that all of your random numbers are defined inside the for loop. Okay, that being said, Go crazy, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.